All right, welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you can see, I was actually trying last minute to pull up some of the images. Um, uh, but I'll go ahead and put that away for now. Uh, welcome to A Thousand Shimmering Lights. Uh, as I always say, this is the only uh, live YouTube planetarium uh, show where you are the planetarium director. In other words, um, you guys and your questions normally drive the discussion here at A Thousand Shimmering Lights. So whatever it is you guys are interested in, that's what we talk about. But the James Webb Space Telescope uh, recently released the first uh, images taken by the new telescope, and they are incredible. So tonight is actually a special themed episode where we're going to be talking all about the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, these new images, what we're actually looking at in these new images, um, and all of that. Uh, I see two concurrent viewers according to YouTube. If you are watching the show right now, I'm pretty sure one of those viewers is me because I always keep open uh, one of them just to monitor it and see if it looks bad, basically. But if, uh, if anyone else is here watching, um, definitely say hi in the chat. Let me know that you're here. I always like seeing you guys commenting in the chat because, first of all, I do watch that for questions. And, and I like to think of these as like a hangout session. So we're just kind of hanging out. I like to hear from you guys, talk to you guys. Um, but it also makes me feel like I'm not just alone here talking at my wall because I do see my wall right here. Um, and uh, if I actually see you guys interacting in the chat, it doesn't feel as lonely. It feels more like I'm actually having a conversation with you guys and not just talking to no one. So if you're here, say hi in the chat for me. Um, what I'm going to do real fast is I'm just going to go ahead and um, go to a few different places and... Uh, post about the uh about the session i know i i posted the um the youtube or the um the facebook event that i posted about it um i only posted it last night i didn't do it super long in advance like i normally do um so i don't know if that's going to have an impact on the viewership tonight um also of course this is a uh, this is sort of a come as you want and leave as you want kind of a thing you're not going to be missing anything necessarily if you're not here from the very beginning uh, where you're going to be lost later on or anything like that. Um, so some people may show up later as we're, as we're uh, doing this thing as well. But um, let me just go ahead and post real fast. And I'm just going to put this in a few places so that, you know, people know. that I'm live. I'm going to try and drum up some viewers. <laughs> uh, I'll just do that for one second here. I know this is not the super most exciting part of the video um, if you're already here or if you're watching this later, because I know a lot of people watch these later as well. Um, but this will just take a second and then we'll get into the usual stuff. Cool. All right. Well, uh, like I said, welcome if you're new um, to the channel, and if you're not new to the channel, welcome anyway. Um, and let's go ahead and do a little house cleaning or housekeeping. Uh, nobody's nobody's watching right now, but this will be for people who watch it later uh, on the recording. I'm going to go ahead and talk very briefly about the uh, Astronomy Club. So um, for those of you who have watched the channel before, you might know this already. For those of you who are new... Uh, welcome again, and of course this will be news to you. I am part of the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. In fact, I'm one of the board members for, let me adjust this camera down slightly, uh, for the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. I'm our membership director, so I would not be doing my job if I didn't talk about membership in the club. Uh, obviously not everybody watching this lives in the Jacksonville area, um, but if you do live in the Jacksonville area and you are interested in astronomy, definitely check out Nephis. We have our website, nephis.org. Uh, we also have our Facebook page, simply Nephis, which again stands for Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. Um, if you don't live in the Jacksonville area, um, there's a couple of options. If you live in St. Augustine, there's a club there called Ancient City Astronomy Club. 
ACAC, another great group of guys. I'm a member of both clubs. A lot of people are members of both clubs. Some of their members are members of ours, etc. cetera. Um, but also, if you do live in the Jacksonville area, there's us, and let me tell you about us. First of all, if you're interested in joining NEFUS, you can always do so by going to the website. Go to Membership, Join NEFUS, and you can hit New or Renew Membership, as the case may be. First, last, address, da 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 Memberships are $20 for students and seniors, uh, individuals $40, and family is $50. $50 uh, for the family. We define a family as any two grown adults and however many children they happen to be in charge of. Uh, we don't get super nitpicky on what we consider to be a family. All families are welcome with NEFAS. Uh, we have two additional levels just for people who want to donate more to the club. Um, so we have our benefactor level at $75. I don't expect anyone joining the club for the first time to be a benefactor. And I'm always honest with people, you don't get anything extra. Your name is mentioned in the newsletter. You get a nice pat on the back from me, and I thank you for helping us stay afloat. But really, that's just for people who re who are dedicated to the club and they really want to give more. So I'm always honest out of the gate. It's just more. It's just to donate more. Um, and then corporate is, um, again, if you have a small business here in Jacksonville, and you want to advertise in our newsletter and be a member and really support the club and be a corporate sponsor is what this level is for. Now, these memberships are annual, by the way. So this student membership, if you're in college, $20 a whole year of membership in Nevis. Uh, so these are really, really not bad membership rates. Also, our club is a member of the Astronomical League. So is the ACAC and most astronomy clubs in the country. So if you're a member of NEFIS, you're also a member of the Astronomical League and the Dark Sky Network. I uh, believe the Dark Sky Network. I'll have to double check that one. But for sure, the Astronomical League, uh, we just pay all of our members dues for them and send all their names in. And so you're a member through us in that organization as well. In case you want to start getting different certifications for observing goals, maybe make Master Observer, that kind of thing. If you don't live in the Jacksonville area, I still highly encourage you to get involved with whatever your local astronomy club happens to be. Um, because if you are interested in the hobby, astronomy club is the way to go. If you've got your own equipment and you want to get into it and learn more about observing and, and get and be a part of the community, you definitely want to join a club. Even if you don't, you want to check out the calendar or newsletter of whatever is your local astronomy club because of all the great events that astronomy clubs do that you can take part in. And with that in mind, I'm going to do like I always do and talk briefly about our calendar. But let me just double check and see if anyone's joined the stream. Not yet. So again, this will be mostly for people watching later. But this is our calendar of, of, of upcoming events. Again, if you don't live in Jacksonville, you can skip ahead in the video if you're watching this later. But um, one thing we've got coming up um, this Saturday and next Saturday are... The two Saturdays this month that fall closest to last quarter and new moon, which means they are dark sky observing sessions. Now, right out of the gate, what I will say is our dark sky observing sessions are not what we call outreach. Outreach is the term we use for when we set up telescopes for other people to look through. Um, I'm going to talk about some outreach events coming up, um, but bear in mind that our dark sky observing site is the one thing we actually do for ourselves. So our telescopes are not there set up um, to, you know, have a line of people lined up looking through and say, oh, look at this, you know, and this is uh, for public education purposes. This is us making our own observations. But if you have equipment and you'd like to get out under a dark sky and experience what it's like to do astronomy as a team sport <laughs> in what is sometimes called a star party, uh, these are a great opportunity. Um, we also unofficially go to our dark sky location at random times. If there's ever a good night of observing, people often hop on Facebook and say, hey, I'm headed out. You know, who's with me? But um, these are scheduled sessions where I meet people at the firehouse subs in McClenny uh, and lead them out to the observing site. Now, this Saturday, I actually have plans already, but I'll probably end up arranging with somebody to meet people and lead them out to our observing site if I can't make it. And if the weather is good, the weather's really not been great lately, and I'm not holding out high hopes for this Saturday, if I'm being perfectly honest. But if the weather holds, we'll be doing that event. And we do that, like I said, twice a month. Um, it is a remote location. So we go all the way out to the middle of the Osceola State Forest. 
um, into like a big clearing in the woods. Uh, we meet at a firehouse subs and drive out there so new people can come out there with us. And there's no bathroom services. There's no cell service for most people. Um, it's very remote. And I just warn people in advance, that's what it is, right? Again, it's not an outreach event. It's not easy access. It's a remote location that we use for observing. There's wildlife, uh, four-legged and two-legged. And uh, we have procedures in place to make sure that everyone's safe, right? We go in numbers. We make noise so that the wildlife avoids us, that kind of thing. We have never had an incident with wildlife to date, and we always try to keep it that way. Also, uh, be warned, the Florida State Swamp Bird, i.e. the giant mosquito, uh, is endemic out there. Uh, if you want to go out there, bring DEET. Um, I, I know that some people think that their amethyst crystal or special candles are going to keep those mosquitoes at bay. They will not. They will show up and they will carry away your dog. So put on lots of DEET. Also coming up um, is a private stargaze. So this is actually not open to members of the general public. This is actually a neighborhood here in town that's inviting us to come out and set up telescopes. So I'm not really going to say much more about it other than if you're watching this and you're a member of NEPHIS and you want to volunteer to work this event, um, that is coming up on the 30th. And you can email uh, info at NEPHIS.org or you can email me directly membership at NEPHIS.org for more information about that. Uh, next month, the live stream is going to be on the 18th because it's always the third Thursday. So one, two, three. So between now and then, what else do we have? Well, we got our board of directors meeting on the first. Um, so if you're a member of NEFIS, you can always come and let your voice be heard and take part and see how the sausage is made, especially if you're thinking about joining the board next time we have elections. You'll want to come check that out. Uh, first quarter moon is Friday the 5th, and our first quarter moon always marks our Hannah Park observing session um during the day we're going to have our picnic for nephis members again this is a members only thing members and guests um this is an outreach we're going to have a picnic to celebrate our club but then at seven o'clock um, we're going to do our stargaze so the rules of the park are that they close the gates at 7 30 you must be in by 7 30 after that point if you leave you can't get back into the park right the, the auto gate will swing open and let you out but it won't let you back in um, we don't charge anything. The park charges $5 a car, I believe. So you can carpool and save a little bit of money. But, uh, this is our public outreach and this is where we set up telescopes and it is for everybody, right? All of our telescopes are there for you guys. Our people are there for you guys. None of us is out there trying to meet our own observing goals like we do at the dark sky. This is us there to teach you about astronomy. And uh, I do a laser pointer tour of the sky, which is kind of like an abbreviated version of the, what I do at the beginning of each episode of this show, um, where I take an outrageously powerful laser, fire it into the air, and draw out the constellations in the sky and tell some of the stories and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's always a, it's a great time. We have a policy called Nephus Never Cancels. So regardless of the weather we are there and we have had sessions where we've literally hidden under the pavilion while it's raining and i've just talked about space kind of like i do on this show so no matter what we are always there um obviously it's up to you if you feel like it's worth driving out if there's bad weather conditions but people do show up even when it's raining so we are always there um, other than that, um, full moon's coming up on Thursday the 11th. Uh, we do not have a general meeting in August uh, because a lot of people were away on vacation, so we skip July and August every every year. And then that brings us to the next uh, live stream and then the events after that. So those are some of the upcoming events for Nephis on our calendar. I'm going to check the stream again. It says two people are watching. Uh, again, if you are here, please say hi so I know that you're here. It really helps me to know uh, that people are actually watching the show. So, I, again, I don't feel like I'm just talking to the wall. Um, okay, one person uh, through Facebook informed me that she is watching, but she can't uh, communicate in the chat. So I am talking to at least one people. Awesome. Uh, so uh, for those of you who do know me personally, feel free to use any method of communication at your disposal to interact with me during the show. Uh, for those of you who don't, unfortunately, you're just going to be limited mainly to the comments or possibly Facebook. Um, but with that said, let's go ahead and get going because it is 745. 
And as I predicted, now we got another person showing up. So hopefully these numbers are going to start to rise as the show continues. All right. Well, one thing I like to do at the beginning of every episode. Oop, I think I just saw a comment. Woo. All right. Jane's here and she can't wait to hear about old Jimmy Webb. Yeah. So like I said, tonight's a themed episode, um, but don't let that make you feel like you're not, you can't still participate in the chat and ask questions and you know, make comments and have that conversation because my style for this channel, even when I have a theme is that of a casual hangout, right? We're going to just going to hang out and talk about space. <laughs> That's why I don't do pre-recorded comment content, and that's why you can hear me sneezing during the video, uh, is because none of this is planned. Um, uh, hey, Andrew and Angie are checking in. Excellent. My sister uh, and brother-in-law are watching the show as well. Fantastic. All right, so uh, what I was saying is, as usual, I start these things off by talking about what's in the sky tonight. Oh, and sorry, and I was saying, see, this is how you can tell it's live. I was saying that even though there's a, a, a topic... Definitely still ask questions, chat, hang out, right? We can steer this thing any old way. We're not married to it, and I don't have a two-hour thing prepared for the James Webb. So what's in the sky tonight? Um, this program that I use, as always, this is Stellarium Web. Uh, Stellarium has a downloadable version, which I actually think is a little bit better, and a free web version. They are actually both free. Uh, it's just your style if you want to download it or not. I use the web version for these presentations because for some reason it just streams better than the other one. And uh, let's talk about what's in the sky, though. So this this software, it's free. It shows you the sky. Um, a couple conventions about it. Um, so for one thing you see here, it's actually tracking. These are probably Starlink. Yeah, Starlink satellites here. Shows you all kinds of stuff. This is made by and for astronomers, so it actually has real astronomy objects labeled it doesn't just show you where the constellations are it, it's for observing um and the size of the dot correlates to the brightness of the star so brighter stars appear as bigger dots in the software so keep that in mind also a fun thing about this software is i can use it to time travel i can always go down in the corner and change the calendar an hour so um when we talk about things in the chat we are not limited to uh position and time and space i can go northern hemisphere southern hemisphere i can go winter, spring, summer, and fall. We can talk about anything. But by default, it'll always move you forward to nighttime on the day that you look at it. So this is tonight at about 10 o'clock, it looks like here. Uh, because it does use the 24-hour clock. So subtract 12, that's about 10 o'clock. All right. So what is in the sky tonight? Well, um, we can always find out what's going to be arriving if we look to the east, and we can always find out what we're going to probably miss out on if we don't catch it immediately by looking to the west. And we see here in the east, Saturn. So Saturn is coming back. Saturn's making its appearance. So for all you Saturn heads out there, uh, there's a woman I work with who loves Saturn, and I always tell her when Saturn's in the sky, I um, always let her know to, to go out and look for it. Um, and I get it. Saturn's a beautiful planet. So that one's going to be in the sky. It's low on the horizon at 10 o'clock. But again, if we time travel a little bit, it will come up, right? Followed by Jupiter. Uh, Neptune, if you've got a good telescope and you know what you're doing. Uh, Neptune's difficult. And then right about here, this is, uh, mind you, this is midnight, right? And it's still fairly low. So later this year, we're going to get a better view of Saturn. But it's starting to show up. And then moving into like 1 or 2 in the morning, we finally get Jupiter, and then Mars is just starting to come up. So for Mars, we're probably going to be looking later in the year, but we do have a few planets coming up. But Saturn is doable tonight. If you've got, if we have clear skies and you don't mind staying up till about midnight or so, Saturn is becoming doable. Um, additionally, of course, we have our constellations. Um, in the south southeast sky... We have a couple of constellations associated mostly with the summertime. Um, these are two particularly easy constellations. You see how big the dots are. Um, and I've spotted these from light polluted conditions, one of which is Sagittarius and the other is Scorpius. So it looks like I got a comment on Facebook. Uh,
Cool, cool. All right. Uh, Andrew, who's who's participating in the chat as well, he pinged me some some uh, images about Jupiter from the James Webb. Thank you so much. We'll we'll definitely talk about those Jupiter images. So, uh, spotting Sagittarius, and I'm going to rush through this a little bit tonight because I do have a lot of content I want to get to. Uh, Sagittarius looks like a teapot. If I draw on the lines, you can definitely see, right, here's the body of the teapot. Here's the handle. Here's the spout. Tip me over and pour me out. Uh, here's Caus Borealis, which is the lid of the teapot. So it's supposed to be some kind of centaur, but for me, it is absolutely a teapot. And the cool thing about it is the spout points right at the core of the Milky Way galaxy, right? So right about here-ish, right where the spout is pointing next to this star, if I'm not mistaken, about this neighborhood, is where Sagittarius A star lives, that supermassive uh, black hole at the center of the galaxy. Now, another constellation, and I find that these lines are not quite how I would draw them, so I don't find them super helpful, but this right here is Scorpius, and it's a little hard to tell in the software because it's adding all these other stars, because this software is imagining a really good uh, night of observing. Can I? Here's the other reason why I like the downloaded version. You could actually simulate light pollution and stuff and, and get different views. But uh, these three stars, Antares, Alnia, and Tau Scorpii, they form a sort of curve like this. A crab, Deshuba, and Pi Scorpii form another curve like this. Those two curves, in my opinion, are the easiest way to spot Scorpius. Some people may have other ways of spotting it, but personally, if I find the teapot, I start looking for the red star, so the Antares, look for that other two that form a slight bend, and then the other bend that goes with it, and now I know I'm looking at Scorpius. Those two sets of three stars, I always imagine that's the body of the scorpion, I kind of use my imagination to put the claws in. There's not really any stars for the claws. But then if I add in the lines, you'll see that coming off of it, we get this, following this curve from Antares, we get Epsilon, Mu, this, this, this is Eta, Sargas, uh, Iota Scorpii, Kappa Scorpii, Shaula, and then shoot over to G Scorpii for the stinger, right? This group of stars right here is also sometimes called the fish hook. And in fact, if you've seen the movie Moana, they sail and they're they're going after Maui's fish hook to try and find his fish hook, and they show it in the sky as a constellation. Um, I want to say they added more stars in to make it really clear for the movie, but that is a real thing. The fish hook is in the sky, and the, uh, I want to say several Polynesian cultures really have actually identified this uh, asterism with Maui's fish hook. There's actually a decent amount of real astronomy in Moana. I should talk about it on an episode one day. That's what we're looking at to the south. Um, another easy to spot set of constellations. And you see how I almost have to look straight up for them, right? They're going to start off really high in the sky um, because these are this is definitely a summertime association. And as we leave summertime, they're going to get higher and higher and eventually start off where they're already setting at the beginning of the night, right? Um, let's see here. I'm being told that I'm lagging really, really hard. So last time what it turned out it was is I was downloading a uh, an update, a Windows update. Um, and that's what it was. I really hope that's not happening now. Now last time I was also told that the audio wasn't lagging even though the video was. Is that still the case? Let me know. Only visual audio is fine. Cool, I appreciate you letting me know. All right, so... Um, and, of course, the audio is going to lag behind your comments because it is actually being projected on delay. So even if everything is working perfectly, there just is a delay in the stream. I've tried to set it to the minimum possible, but YouTube just sort of insists on there being a slight delay. So there is. Um, okay, so this group of, of objects, right? If we remove the lines, you'll see there are three really bright stars. Deneb, Vega, Altair. Uh, this forms something called the Summer Triangle. And if we add in the lines, we can see that the triangle is actually associated with three different constellations. Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila. Um, some things to look for here in this piece of sky. Uh, the Ring Nebula is halfway between Sheliac and Sulafat. Sheliac, by the way, um, is one of the locations of an episode in 
uh, the Orville. If you watch Star Trek or if you watch the Orville, they often use real star names for their episodes. And I always personally find it really funny to like find the real star where this episode supposedly takes place. Like it's a really famous episode of Star Trek The Next Generation that takes place on one of the stars in Orion's belt, actually. Uh, it's the one with the proto-Vulcans that mistake Picard for a god. But anyway, about halfway between these two stars is the Ring Nebula. Uh, now tonight we're going to talk about something called the Southern Ring Nebula, which is one of the images by the James Webb. It's not this one, but it's another similar nebula in the Southern Hemisphere sky. Uh, but, the, but the Northern Hemisphere Ring Nebula is very easy to find. You find Vega, you find the parallelogram, and it's halfway between Sheliak and, what was this one, Sulafat. Um, and that's the Summer Triangle. Uh, once you find the Summer Triangle, um, you can use your star charts to find other nearby things, especially Hercules, um, which has a really, really cool globular cluster in it. And then lastly, I'm just going to quickly talk about our circumpolar constellations. Circumpolar are always, uh, for the most part, available to us. And they are really good constellations for first-time observers to get used to finding. So if I turn off the lines, you can immediately see these bright stars right here, right? The Big Dipper, as it's commonly known, or the Plow, to our friends in the UK, is it consists of really bright stars. It's very easy to find. Um, once you have found it, you see the handle and the bowl, what you've actually found is a part of a larger constellation. If I add in the lines, you'll see that it actually includes many more stars. And this is Ursa Major, the Big Bear. But also, if we take these two stars here, whoop, there you saw the you saw the bear there. Let me bring it back for you, All right? Um, long tail bear, and there's a goofy story about that where they're swung by their tails and thrown into the sky, and it stretches out the tail. Um, but if we take this star, Merak, and Dube, and we draw that line and we keep going, we hit Polaris. Uh, Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky. It's a common misconception. Polaris is actually the 43rd brightest star in the sky. Uh, it barely makes the top 50. But why is it so famous? Because it's always north. If I time travel in the software, you'll see everything goes around Polaris. And that is why the constellations closest to Polaris are called circumpolar, because they go around the pole star. Once you've found Polaris, you have found a dim and difficult to see constellation, I'll be honest. You do have to get somewhere dark for this one. What you'll usually see is Polaris, and then you'll see these two stars, Kochab and Ferkad. Between them are these very faint stars, Zeta, Ursii, Minoris. Uh, Minoris, because Ursa Minor is the name of the constellation. I can't even click this star. What's this guy called? Gaia, some other nonsense. Uh, Epsilon, Ursa Minoris, Yildun, and of course Polaris, that form the Little Dipper, also called Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Other circumpolar constellations are Cepheus, which I've always found to be sort of vaguely house-shaped, and Cassiopeia, and Cassiopeia is another great guidepost constellation, because again, these stars are fairly bright. Ignore the background ones. If you're if you're somewhere without a lot of light pollution, with a lot of light pollution, um, this is actually easy to spot because it'll be the only stars to get through the light pollution, and it forms this sort of W shape or M shape depending on when in the year it is, um, because it'll wrap around the other side. So sometimes it looks like an M, sometimes it looks like a W, and it's cool because if I fast forward the time a little bit. As we move into winter time, this will be get easier and easier to see. You won't have to stay up till midnight, but it points at the Andromeda Galaxy, also known as Messier 31. So it's a really cool one to know how to find. As we move into the winter, I will talk some more in future episodes about how to find the Andromeda Galaxy. I'm going to take a quick pause to check my chat. Uh, yeah, visual lag, audio is good, stabilized now, maybe, okay. Uh, I'm watching the little uh, example here, and I can see myself lagging. So, yeah, I, maybe it'll come and go. We'll see. But, gosh, I you know, got to find out why. You know what? Actually, I think part of it is is I um, my graphics card I was using died on me, and I'll bet you that um, 
the video is being processed through the graphics card, and so I'm not using as great a graphics card as I used to. Although, um, I don't know. I feel like my regular card should be able to handle this, and then it's probably just the bit rate that's the problem. But who knows? All right. So we're going to get into the James Webb Telescope. So right out of the gate, my first question when I heard that there was this James Webb Telescope uh, years ago, or not years ago, but a while back when they were they were going to launch it, man, and it was like every month, oh, it's delayed again, it's delayed again. But my first thought was, who the heck is James Webb? <laughs> right? Why does he get a telescope named after him? Uh, this the heck is James Webb. This, this guy right here. Um, he was a director at NASA. I honestly don't know a lot about him, if I'm being honest. I like to be honest and admit ignorance in this in this channel. I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, I was doing a little bit of reading about him earlier today, um, kind of like in the heyday of NASA and the sort of Apollo program era. I think he was the second director. And I was like, there was a guy before him, I think. Um, and yeah, they named the James Webb Space Telescope after him. And interestingly, there was a bit of controversy about it. I didn't even know about this until I was telling my roommate I was going to run this episode. And he said, um, you know, there was actually a bit of a controversy about naming the telescope after him. So I started reading up on him. Uh, and the controversy has to do with something that was called um, the Lavender Panic, which was um, in the 50s and 60s, you know, in the Apollo days, uh, there was this widespread uh, thing where in government run agencies and things, they were sort of rooting out and then firing uh, homosexual people. And it's honestly a blight and a stain on the history of NASA and our country. Uh, it's an embarrassment uh, that we did that. I should be clear. It's an embarrassment that they were, that they were, uh, you know, rooting out and, persecuting people and there's some debate as to what role did James Webb play during that now I'm not going to get super into it and say if I'm on one side or the other because I don't know enough about it to be able to say what his role was and from what I was reading I was kind of reading different things uh, I just read basically what was on the Wikipedia article about it you can read it too and it, some people say there's not really any evidence that he was super involved. And others say, of course he was involved. I honestly don't know. Um, and also, I'm going to not get super into my opinion on whether or not we should name a telescope after him. At this point, the telescope is named after him. But it seemed disingenuous of me not to at least mention the controversy since I do know about it briefly. I know of it. Um, so that's what that is. And some people were saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't name the telescope after him. Um, what I will say is, um, I'm honestly a little surprised that the telescope wasn't named after an astronomer. It was named after the, um, you know, the head of NASA. Like I know why Hubble has a telescope. He's Hubble, right? Hubble did a lot. And I had never heard of James Webb until this telescope, but it is what it is. I'm more interested, though, in this James Webb. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, this telescope may not look much like a telescope if you are new to telescopes. Um, so what most people think of the telescope is a long tube with a lens at one end and the eyepiece at the back. Or if you have a bit more experience, you might have seen like Newtonian telescopes and this kind of thing. Really all you need for a telescope is some way to take a bunch of light and focus it, right, so that you can observe. Some way to capture, and the bigger your telescope, the more light you can capture and focus in so fainter objects become bright enough to observe. That's the basic principle of, te of how telescopes work. So what you're actually seeing with a James Webb telescope is a method for doing that. It is a reflecting telescope, all big telescopes, past a certain size, are reflecting telescopes. And the reason is because all you have to do is somehow focus light. So a lens can focus light by being thicker glass in the middle and thinner near the edges. The light passes through at different rates because the light is impeded by the glass, and that causes some the light near the outside to be bent more than the inside and a focusing effect. Or you can make a bowl-shaped mirror so that because mirrors bounce back light at the opposite incident angle, 
where the mirror bends up like this, the light that hits gets bounced inward, whereas near the base of the bowl, the light basically bounces straight, and again, that has a focusing effect like a lens. That's how my telescope works. That's how a lot of people's telescope works. Um, so a bowl-shaped mirror will do it. What's really cool, though, is with you know high-precision engineering, you can make a mirror out of segments instead of one big hunk of metal right, or glass or whatever. And the advantage of mirrors, by the way, the reason why all the big guys are mirrors is because once you get past a certain size, making a lens that's like the size of a car would be prohibitive because the lens has to be a single piece. You can't make it in segments. It has to be thick in the middle, so you'd be looking at just a ton of glass, literally tons of glass, to make something this size. It's just... And the the tolerance is making optical gray glass that size is just not at all practical. Mirrors are the way to go. Now... The first thing you might notice here, as we're looking at it, and I'm going to check real fast for, for questions as well. Uh, Mike says James Webb was genius at getting funds from Congress. Uh, the astronauts felt that without him, there would not have been a space program. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I'm not here to um, necessarily besmirch anyone's legacy. Uh, I've heard different things about him. But yeah, so uh, gosh, if we're going to talk about these pictures, I really want to have a higher quality stream. I'm going to try something that I don't normally do and I'm going to switch off my camera and we're going to see if the quality of the stream improves when it doesn't have to show my face in real time. Uh, so I'm going to disappear from your screen or I've already disappeared from your screen and I'm going to start to watch the stream and see if it clears up at all. Um, if it doesn't, then I'll, I guess I can always put my face back on there, but all right. So we're looking here at the James Webb. And one question that you might have is why yellow, right? If these are mirrors, why don't they look like mirrors? Why are they yellow? Well, I learned today that they are actually gold-plated beryllium. Yes, NASA spent millions of dollars sending a gold-plated telescope into space. Now, actually, the gold plating is extremely thin on these things. Um, I haven't actually worked it out, so I don't want to make any quotes and be wrong but I want to say it's something like if you scooped all that gold up, you could make like a ring. It's not a huge amount of gold. Uh, maybe a bit more. I don't know. This is a really big telescope. Um, but it's important that it be gold because of the properties of gold, not just because they're trying to bling out their telescope. Um, basically, this telescope mirror is not meant to reflect visible light. Right? They're not trying to actually capture visible light, visible spectrum images. This is highly reflective and highly mirrored, specifically in the infrared part of the spectrum. So one thing to learn tonight about the James Webb, first uh, interesting thing to learn, the mirrors are plated in a very, very thin layer of gold over beryllium, interesting, of all materials. Um, and that makes it reflective in the infrared because the James Webb telescope is not a visible light telescope the way that the Hubble was. It doesn't use the visible spectrum. It takes images in the infrared. And that knowledge is going to help us better understand the images when we get to looking at some of the images. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about some of the components of the James Webb. Again, like I was saying before, as a stream is fine with or without me, okay, then I'm going to come back because I'm a narcissist and I want you to see me. Okay, so not really. All right, so um, we'll talk a little bit about the components of this James Webb Space Telescope. You see it a little bit down here in the bottom. This is called the telescope bus. Um, this includes a lot of things like uh, the reaction wheels. I want to say this thing uses reaction wheels to orient itself and aim itself. Um, solar panels to power it. The antenna to beam this stuff back to Earth. That kind of thing. Although, actually, this might be the antenna up here. I'm not really sure. Um, and then this uh, five-layer beam burrito. What is going on here with this big diamond shape? Well, the telescope has to be able to see infrared light but if the telescope isn't kept very cold and i looked it up and it was something like minus 90 fahrenheit or something ridiculous really really cold if this uh actually we could we could find out because i got the article going on here wikipedia ladies and gentlemen um uh, let's see here how cold does it have to be i was reading this earlier today on my lunch break uh here we go yeah, oh man, never mind. Minus, I was way off. 
minus 369.7 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 223.2 Kelvin or, or uh, Celsius Fif- or 50 Kelvin. The Kelvin scale starts at absolute zero um, and then goes up with the same scale as Celsius. So 50 Celsius degrees above the coldest it's possible to be is how cold they have to keep this telescope. Because if it warms up, it will itself begin emitting uh, infrared light, right? Just like how the, you know, if you've seen like infrared cameras and you can see like people glowing in the dark, right, by their heat signature, we have to keep the telescope itself freezing cold so that it doesn't emit its own infrared that will completely overshadow the extremely faint infrared signatures it's trying to pick up. Um, but what happens is, so this big mirror is going to focus the light, but it's going to, what it's going to do is it's a mirror, right? It's just going to bounce it away. Well, we don't want that. So there's a second mirror at the front that looks at the big mirror. So the, the light comes in, it bounces off this big mirror. It focuses to the second mirror and then it bounces back to this thing in the middle. And this is where, um, the equipment is. That's actually where all the sensors are. Now you might wonder why not just mount the sensors out here? Well, the focal length of a telescope um, plays a part in its properties, right? And so by mounting it here, the light gets to bounce, hit the front, and then go back again. That's like getting twice the focal length that you would if you just mounted it where that mirror is. Um, And then this primary mirror would have to be more more curved than it is. and then when you curve a mirror too much, you're, you're getting like a lot of distortion and ab- uh, what we call aberration. So it's better to mount it back here. Um, you would think that this gets in the way and would put like a big spot in the middle of the image, but actually they just focus right past it. And a lot of amateur telescopes use a similar concept, except amateur scopes, the secondary mirror is at an angle and bends the li- bent- bounces the light out the side. Uh, what's in the middle here in this instrumentation package Oh, sorry, I was talking about how cold it has to be. So this big thing is to shield it from the sun. I I forgot that part. So this is basically multiple layers of heat shielding with gaps between them so they act like a radiator um, to protect the telescope from the sun's heat. Um, This telescope does not orbit the Earth, by the way. It is orbiting a Lagrange point, and we can talk a little bit about what that means. But where is it? Here it is. So... Here is the Earth, here is the Sun, there is the L2 Lagrange point. What that is, is the Earth's gravitational field gets progressively less as you get further from the Earth, and so does the Sun's. The Sun's gravity is more powerful than the Earth, but at this distance, the Earth is closer, the Sun is further away, but this happens to be a spot where it winds up being equivalent, right? The Earth and Sun are having an equal hold, basically, versus the centrifugal force of the orbit itself, which would want to pull the thing away, right? And so you wind up with a stable location in space that an object can orbit around this point and not fall towards the Earth or the Sun or whatever, but basically just be held there. And as the Earth orbits, it basically drags the telescope with it gravitationally. Um, The actual orbital path is what's called a halo orbit, and here are three different diagrams taken from three different angles showing basically what that means. And I'll be honest, I'm not super knowledgeable about it, so that's all I'm going to say about that. So that's the James Webb. Um, Like I said, it takes images in the infrared part of the spectrum. And I'm checking the chat now. Looks like we got... uh, uh, Oh, my dad's here. Charlie Mike uh, saying now he can chat. Cool, cool. Um, All right, so... uh, yeah, so that's what the well, that's what it does, and it takes infrared images. So, with that said, here is I'm going to show a couple more pictures, and we're going to get into the actual photos, the real reason you guys are here tonight, right? Um, here's a picture of uh, the guys who worked on this next next to a test article. This one is not the one that's actually mounted on the James Webb. This is a test article, but if we look at this previous image, right, this is how big it is compared to people. This thing was absolutely huge, absolutely huge telescope um, with a ton of points of, of, of possible failure, apparently. Um, and this is something I'm going to talk about in a bit, so we'll move that further down. 
a little spoiler for you guys there. All right. So, if there's no other questions in the chat, we will get into some of the images. So, first of all, this is the one that my brother-in-law sent me at the beginning of the thing. Andrew, what's up? Um, this is Jupiter. And there's a couple of interesting things about this picture, a couple of things I like about it. First of all, in a weird sort of way, I like that this picture demonstrates that the James Webb isn't perfect at everything, right? The James Webb is a tool designed for a purpose. And what the James Webb will not do is give us like a Voyager style high definition image of Jupiter, right? Uh, it's going to give us an image of Jupiter in the infrared part of the spectrum, right? What you can see is different cloud bands have different brightnesses in the, in the infrared. Now, some of this is from reflecting infrared from the sun that hits the atmosphere in the places where Jupiter is absorbing that light. You know, it's going to appear darker where it's bouncing. It's going to appear lighter. Um, but also places where Jupiter itself may be producing some infrared radiation in its own atmosphere may not be as opaque in certain areas. And so more of that infrared is kind of getting through. Uh, and, you know, here's the great red spot. But like I said, not a, not, I'm probably not going to make it my wallpaper on my computer, right? It's probably just going to be whatever, but you know, that's, this is the kind of image James Webb does. It does infrared. Um, this is something really interesting. So this is not an image. This is actually um, a set of data. So the, the James Webb telescope has some instruments that don't take pictures. They just detect levels of light in the infrared and different parts of the spectrum. Um, so this is the NIRIS uh, instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope, which, uh, according to our object, because there is a list here that just tells us what all the different instruments are called. Here we go. So I don't see Nair. Oh, here it is, Nairus. Uh, near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph is what that stands for. Cool. Um, some of these instruments were, were actually sponsored by different space agencies, by the way. So if you read the Wikipedia article, it's actually really interesting. Like certain parts were donated by the European Space Agency and so on. Um, sort of a global effort, this telescope. Uh, what this is doing is it's looking at distant exoplanets. So this star dims slightly in a recurring pattern that tells us that there's a planet there. Um, and there's also something called a variable star, but there's a way to tell the difference. And we know that there's a planet there. Well, in astronomical terms, things that are hot emit the visible spectrum or above for the most part. Things that are cool from an astronomical standpoint tend to glow in the infrared. And that may be surprising to hear because in our everyday life, we think of infrared meaning heat, right? And I've even had people say, like, infrared light, in other words, heat energy. But actually, all light is produced by things that are hot. The hotter you get something, the different parts of the spectrum it will glow. And you heat up a piece of iron, it starts to glow in the visible spectrum. We glow in the infrared because we're just not very hot in the grand scheme of things. So actually, you want to flip that thought and think of infrared being related to cool objects when it comes to astronomy, Right, And so planets orbiting stars, they're going to register more in the infrared than they are going to in the visual. So by analyzing the infrared light coming off of these planets orbiting distant stars, we can actually analyze the compositions of their atmospheres, which is really cool. And here we see the signature of these bumps right here correspond to where we would expect to find, in the, and this is the whole spectrum, these, these are the different wavelengths of infrared and in the infrared part of the spectrum there should be a peak here 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 and here if there's water so that tells us there's water in the atmosphere of that planet right it's very cool stuff uh let's see i feel like i'm going kind of fast and i can slow down a little bit i'm going to come back to this image did i find a nice big picture yeah uh this one is decent I was kind of rushing before the thing started because I wanted to find a better picture of this one. Um, can I just control plus it? Yeah, I can. Okay. So 
this image right here is one of the new pictures released by the web, and it's my personal favorite, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about what's actually going on in this picture. So you might remember, you may know, um, and actually a lot of the people watching this show I know personally would definitely be... Um, would definitely be uh, familiar with what I'm about to talk about. Uh, you may be familiar with the Hubble Deep Field. And I see there's a, a comment in the chat real fast. The images I sent you stated they were calibration shots prior to the one's public release. Kind of cool to see the rings around Jupiter. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that was a calibration shot using Jupiter as a practice shot. Good to know. Uh, so you might have seen um, the Hubble Deep Field and know the story behind that. They pointed the Hubble at a piece of sky. Here, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just bring it up. Uh, where's my Wikimedia Commons? All right. Uh, Hubble Deep Field. Uh, they found an empty patch of sky, and they lit the telescope just sit and gather light and gather light and gather light and gather light. And, gather light. and, and then turns out it was just absolutely full of galaxies, right? This is what they got. Okay. So the James Webb did that with a piece of sky... That would be this whole image takes up a region of the night sky that is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. That's how small a piece of sky we're looking at. Uh, but it did the same kind of thing. It gathered light for a long time and made this image. Um, but the first thing I want to point out is this is not an image taken in visible light. This image was taken in the infrared. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that was the case. But isn't it interesting that it looks like a regular full-color image? So what's going on? This is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show. Because I wanted to talk a little bit about how to understand these images. Because the uh, you know when they released these to the public, I think a lot of people saw this and they thought, oh, they snapped a picture like you would with a camera. But the truth is actually really interesting. So none of this is the visible part of the spectrum right? Even if it weren't for the fact that this is so dim, we can't see it, right? Even if you somehow took that infrared light and just amplified it, it would still be invisible because it's infrared. We don't see infrared. So why is it colorful? Because the colors are visible light. Why does it look like visible light? Well, this image was taken with um, the, I want to say it was the Miri on this one, which is the mid infrared instrument. And uh, there's the visible spectrum. Once you go below red, you get to infrared. So actually, let me bring up, I'm going to bring up the spectrum real fast. Uh, I should go the other way around here. All right. Spectr uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Right, so... This is this is actually a decent uh, image. And actually, this is not to scale. This is like a logarithmic scale because if you stretched it out linearly, the visible spectrum is barely a blip. But this is the visible part of the spectrum of light. All of this is actually light, right? But only a small portion of the light that exists can actually be seen. And what you're seeing here is actually the wavelength, right? Towards the violet end of the spectrum, you have high energy light with very short wavelengths, right? Really short wavelengths. Towards the red, the wavelengths are more stretched out and it's lower energy. If you get even longer wavelengths of light below the red, you get to infrared, below red. If you go past violet, you get to ultraviolet. Um, so the infrared is the light below red, but not quite to the point of microwaves. Which, yes, microwaves are actually long, stretched out wavelengths. You'd probably think it would be like the high energy stuff that you're nuking your food with, but actually not. Um, but anyway, so this infrared part of the spectrum is a spectrum itself. There's what's called the near infrared, which are wavelengths close to red, but not quite. The mid infrared, which are longer still. And then the far infrared, which are very stretched out. And then we start to get into microwaves, radio waves, and so on. But here's the thing about color. It's not real. Not really. Color is a label that your brain applies to wavelengths of light. 
So when you get a light of a certain wavelength, your brain assigns it the color green or blue or whatever, and you see green, blue, etc. But that light itself is just a wavelength of electromagnetic energy uh, traveling as a photon, but also as a wave because quantum mechanics is weird. So if we think of colors as labels and we have a series of colors that we can see and we have a series of light that is invisible to us, then we can imagine that those are basically like colors we can't see, right? But what we can do is we can take that visible spectrum and we're looking at this image, right? So when we take this picture right here, this picture is actually a stack of many images taken by the James Webb. So here's the, the mid-infrared, right? There's really long wavelengths. We take an exposure of those, and it's a black and white. They get a black and white image of this wavelength, this wavelength, this wavelength, this one, this one, throughout the infrared. Then they stack those all up to make an image. But before they do, each of those images gets colorized. And what they do is they just assign colors to them in the same order as the visible spectrum. The longest ones they assign red, the shortest ones they assign blue. And what they're effectively doing is just taking the visible spectrum and sliding it down and superimposing it onto the spectrum of what the James Webb can actually observe, which is infrared light. And so the image we get as a result looks like just a visual image. It just looks like regular visible light imagery, except that actually it's, it's, these colors are superimposed onto it. Now, what's happening in this image, I could actually talk all night about this image. I probably should have saved this one, but I'm going to keep talking about it. What's happening in this image, these are all distant galaxies. Now, one thing I have mentioned before when I talked about my galaxy special episode is I mentioned Edwin Hubble, from whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named. And I, uh, I mentioned how one of the things he figured out was redshift, right? So if, you, if, you, if you're not familiar with Redshift or you didn't see that episode, basically there's something called the Doppler effect. So if something is headed towards you and it's emitting a sound, we're going to start off with sound and then explain how it applies to light. So if something's coming towards you emitting a sound and it's traveling fast enough, <clears throat> the sound waves, it's putting out sound waves, but it's also running up to them as it does. And they bunch up in front of the object. So as it's coming towards you, those bunched up sound waves will have a shorter wavelength than they should, and they will sound more high-pitched than they should. Once it passes you, it's emitting sound waves behind it, but it's also running away from them as it does. And so those sound waves come out more stretched out. And so stretched out sound waves are a lower pitch, so it sounds like a deeper pitch than it should be. This is the reason why if you're standing on the side of the street and an ambulance goes by, you hear that, right? And the pitch drops as it goes past you. If you were sitting in the ambulance, the pitch would be constant. You would just hear a normal pitch. But as it passes, you get that effect. So as objects move in space, light waves behave the same way. And it happens to be that light waves in front of an object bunching up, well, shorter wavelengths of light, if you remember from when we were looking at our spectrum here, that's getting towards the blue end. So we call that blue shifting. As objects are running away and those wavelengths stretch out, that's called red shifting, and things are more towards the red part of the spectrum. Now what this means, and that actually brings us back to this picture right here. Nope, nope, not that one. This one. Um, what that means is because the universe is expanding and the space between galaxies is expanding and stretches out the light waves with it, the further away something is, the more the light that it emitted in the visible part of the spectrum has slid down to the red end. And it happens to be that past a certain point, you just can't see anything because the light has slid clean off the visible part of the spectrum and into the infrared, right? So all these galaxies emitted their light in visible light, but they're so far away that the visible image of these galaxies has slid all the way down those light waves all stretched out too much. And basically that image is now in the infrared instead of the visible part of the spectrum like it would be if you were just sitting next to it. So by taking the visible spectrum and sliding it down and assigning it to those images, what the researchers have essentially done is restored what the galaxies actually did look like in visible light. 
Now, when we look at the nearby objects of the James Webb Telescope, they haven't been redshifted like this. And so the infrared really will look different from the visible image. But for these galaxies, it's more like restoring what they actually look like. But even still, even in this image, the further the galaxy is away, the redder it's going to look because it is still slid down far in that infrared and will, even with the reassignment of the colors, appear more red. If that makes sense. Hopefully you guys are kind of following that. But that's how the colors are applied to these James Webb images. So uh, supposedly there's like conspiracy theories going around that these images are fake. Um, no, they are edited, but they are not fake. Um, and the interesting thing that this picture is pointing out, though, is that because of something called the Hubble constant, which is the universe is expanding at a certain rate, the amount of red shifting correlates to how far away an object is, right? And so um, Hubble first figured this out. But what this means is by looking at how red shifted something is, we can actually figure out how far it is. And this takes a few of the galaxies from this picture and uses them as examples. So this galaxy right here, um, and the trick to this, by the way, is how do you know that it, that's actually slid down? How do you know that that's not just light that's supposed to be there, right? How do you know? Well, as I mentioned before, different chemical elements leave a signature, fingerprints in the light spectrum, right? There'll be peaks in the brightness at certain wavelengths that correlate with certain chemical elements. This is a very simplified view just for demonstrational purposes, but they're showing how you can identify the telltale markers of hydrogen and oxygen. Um, you see that there's a couple lines here that indicate hydrogen, right? Because the fingerprint might be split out across the spectrum. Uh, so you can find those in the spectrum of this galaxy here. And then you can see how far into the infrared has this been relocated from where it should be. And so that tells us that this galaxy right here is about 11.3 billion years. This is actually in light years. This is how this is how old the light is, how long that light's been traveling to us, but it's also how far away it is. This is 11.3 billion light years away, which is mind-blowing. Um, and then we see that this galaxy over here, those signs of uh, oxygen and hydrogen have slid further into the infrared. So that tells us that this is actually further away, right? And so we get to this 13.1. Look at this guy way in the background of the image. The universe is only 13 and a half billion years old. And we're looking at something... Um, Four billion year or point four billion years, four hundred million years after the Big Bang, this light left this galaxy, and it's only just now getting to us. Um, from all the way back then, it's thirteen point one billion light years from here. Um, so we're literally peering back to almost the beginning of time with this telescope. It's absolutely incredible to think about it, and and here and here they show how far shifted that light has slid all the way into the infrared, almost getting into microwave territory, right? Um, this image shows how a similar method was actually used to identify some galaxies, but I'm gonna come back around to this. Here's something that you guys might've noticed. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm curious if anyone in the chat um, would notice what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna look at the chat real fast, but I'm gonna give you guys an opportunity to put in the chat what are some things that you notice about this picture that stand out to you as maybe being a little weird about this image in particular while I check the chat for some, uh, for some stuff here? Uh, how can the image be of it 11.5 billion years ago and it be in that location of the universe if the universe is expanding? Shouldn't we see it where it is, where it was, not where it is? Uh, and in fact, we do, right? We do see it. Uh, where it was, not where it is. So um, assuming that it's not just moving directly away from us, right? This particular galaxy might be over here now, but it's light looks like it's coming from over here. So actually to answer the question, you're right. These are not where these objects still are necessarily. Um, it appears to be taken with a fisheye lens. So it looks like it's spinning. Good. You guys all noticed the thing. I was hoping you would notice, which is this wild distortion that we're seeing. Almost like you used a fisheye lens or like 
went into Photoshop and used like a blow that, that you know that blowy up tool that makes it like stretch in the middle and makes it all look all weird, right? It almost looks like did we not calibrate the telescope right? Is this a funhouse mirror image? What's happening? Uh, somebody already spoiled a little bit by saying gravitational lensing, but that's not a spoiler. That's called good job you knew what it was. What it was. We're all learning, but yeah, this is what we call gravitational lensing, and I'm going to talk about what that is. So this big, long, stretchy, curvy thing should look like a dot. That's actually a distant galaxy. By the way, just so you know, these big, you know, eight-pointed things here, those are stars in our own galaxy that kind of photobomb this image. Every other speck in this thing is an entire galaxy, right? These little dots you see in the background, those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. But this big stretched-out thing is a galaxy, and so is this big, weird, wonky one stretched over here, this weird-looking guy. So what is actually happening? What you're seeing is the fabric of reality being distorted. That's actually what it is. It really is that cool. So gravity, we learn in, in uh, school a simplified understanding of gravity. We learn Isaac Newton's understanding of gravity. And then if you are like taking AP classes maybe or you take physics in high school or you get into college or whatever, you might learn it. You might get into the Einstein stuff. So... What we tend to learn in school is that gravity is the force that pulls things to the earth, right? Or the sun or whatever, and that gravity is an attractive force between objects of mass. That is true, kind of. So gravity isn't actually one object reaching out and going bee -bee 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 with a force and pulling the other one in. It's a That force that we perceive is actually a manifestation of what's really happening. What's really happening is is that all matter in the universe warps the fabric of space-time around it. So you do this, right? My cup does this. Actually slightly bends reality, space and time, around all objects of mass. But the effect itself is very weak. So it takes a lot of mass to do this to a noticeable degree. And because the fabric of space is being warped around an object uh, nearby objects that are moving relative to it are accelerating through what appears to be an, uh, a, a, a reference frame distorted by this distortion and it basically results in objects pulling towards each other because those distortions in space time kind of you sort of fall into it basically that's sort of a layman's understanding and it's not a great analogy because it invokes gravity as an analogy to explain gravity the real thing but bear with it right you kind of fall into that distortion that's the best way to kind of explain it it's weird it just is weird um so that's what's happening but what that means is if you get enough mass you can noticeably bend the universe around some object and what's really cool is that light itself is actually affected by this even though light has no mass, um, just because it just gets bent through that bent space. So you notice in the middle of the image are these big white galaxies. Now, part of why they're white is, remember, the colors have been assigned after the fact to all the different wavelengths, so these ones must be shining really brightly in every wavelength of infrared that they're imaging. And in fact, that's because these guys are not red shifted like the guys behind them. So they're just glowing super bright from the James Webb's perspective. Um, and so they just look white. But this is a nearer cluster, nearer than the background stuff, cluster of really big galaxies. This, this one right here in the middle is really, really big. And then the other stuff are like way, way further behind this cluster. And the mass of these galaxies is warping space-time so much that these guys that you see that are stretched out, this galaxy isn't here. This galaxy is actually behind this one. But it's taking the light. Like, here's the big thing. The light comes, and it gets warped around to the front like that and smeared out. And so the light of galaxies that are further in the background, like this one is behind this guy, right? Or probably maybe slightly off-center or whatever. And that light gets smeared around it. But what's even weirder is it can even duplicate the image. So if we go to this picture right here, this hot spot and this hot spot on this one arc, that's actually one galaxy. That's the same galaxy. And you can tell because they have matching spectra of light, right? Um, slight differences in how intense that light is because one's being bent 
more strongly, right? It's kind of like if you shine light through a lens and you get a couple different lens flares, they're not all the same brightness. That's kind of what's happening here. But that actually is the image of a single galaxy that's behind um, this big bright guy here. So, yeah, this gravitational lensing is the term we have for that effect. And when I first saw this image, that's what blew me away about it. Excuse me. Got to keep the got to keep hydrated here while I'm going to be talking all night. So that's the main thing that really blew me away about this image and why I really wanted to spend a lot of time talking about this picture because that gravitational lensing effect is super cool. Uh, someone says my beard is bending space time. Yeah, right. Essentially, there's mass here in the beard. Plus, I mean, I like to think my mirror, my beard has an effect on the universe. All right, I'm just going to take a quick little look at Facebook, see if anyone's trying to talk to me there, because I know not everybody can participate in the chat. Um, and taking a look at the, the chat log as well. So like I said, definitely uh, continue hanging out and talking in the chat. But that is this picture. Before we move on to the next picture, I do want to address one other thing. If you've been looking at pictures of the James Webb images, you've probably noticed this thing going on, these big spikes what is with these big spikes? Well, first of all, distant objects don't produce those spikes. Those spikes happen when something is so very bright that it's like overwhelming the instrumentation. In other words, stars in our own galaxy are producing these spikes. But where does this spike pattern come from? Because this exact pattern of spikes is unique to the James Webb. And it's one of those things that you know, decades from now, if you're looking at pictures, you will always be able to tell James Webb took this picture because you will see six big spikes, right, arranged in a, in a nice symmetrical pattern, and then a smaller horizontal spike, or that may be rotated in that particular picture. So what's happening with those spikes? And that's what this diagram is to explain. What these are, these are called diffraction spikes, and they're just an, they're an artifact, basically. So there's actually two sets of diffraction spikes that overlay. So the hexagons, uh, because they are hexagonal and they have hard edges, right? When the light hits that hard edge, it's going to scatter. And so you're going to get linear scatter in all six directions because that's the shape of a hexagon. Right, So you see how the edges are color-coded in this image, and so too are the diffraction spikes. By the way, I got this off the Wikipedia article on the James Webb, so if you want to look at this picture later, you can get it there. So, you know, the top and bottom edges, as it were, are going to produce this big spike. You know, the ones that are going in this direction produce this spike, and so on. And that gives us the six big spikes in the, in the image. Now, this is something we call the spider. The spider is the term for the thing that holds the secondary mirror. Uh, even in an amateur telescope, we call that thing the spider. And there's the mirror in the middle. So if we go back to our picture of, not him, that way, there we go. These bars, right, holding this deal in the middle, light coming from a distant object hits that bar and it gets split to either side of the bar and produces a pair of spikes as well. So... The presence of each bar creates a pair of spikes that lies perpendicular, or actually not perpendicular, now that I'm looking at it, um, but, but that cuts across that thing based on the angle at which it meets the secondary mirror. So this red one at the top produces this horizontal row of spikes, and then this one and this one produce these two. And what's interesting is these are not equilaterally spaced, and right now as I'm talking, it dawned on me why that is. Because you see how they are the same angle, that 33 degree, I think it is, angle that corresponds with the, color, with the corners of a hexagon, so that two of the pairs of diffraction spikes overlap with the spikes being produced by the hexagon. So they're kind of minimizing the impact by organizing it in this way. But of course, the third one goes vertically, and it can't help but wind up producing a spike that doesn't intersect with these two so if we overlay these two you get that pattern six big spikes and a pair of smaller spikes so that's why we get on these stars these big spikes um and that is the um that is the sort of the signature of the james webb imagery anything you see from the james webb you're going to get six big spikes 
Two little spikes. Uh, in the chat here, we see you're saying those curved shapes are actually from objects behind the object that's been in the light. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. It's really cool. When you get gravitational lensing, a lot of times those objects are actually, if we were in the realm of our everyday lives where objects aren't nearly so massive as to produce a noticeable effect, one object would hide the thing behind it. But you get enough mass and it will just take that light around itself and just smear it out. It's really cool. I And I will say, I don't know 100% that this galaxy, for example, is actually directly behind this guy, but I suspect that it is, because that's often the case with gravitational lensing. If not directly behind, then maybe nearby, but that's what produces that. Okay, now that we've talked about gravitational lensing to death, um, not that I, believe me, I could go on about gravitational lensing. We're going to look at some of the other images from the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. I'm getting some buzzes here. Those are emails. Okay, cool. Um, actually, I guess I should check them because some people do have my email address on the off chance that they're related to the uh, discussion at hand. Okay. It is not. But it is something I need to deal with because I am on the board. So I will look at that later. Uh, do, 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 let's get back to... Uh, so, see, now, I... I think it was like space.com, I think, put out like a set of these images. Here we go. Uh, let's get the full width. That's what it was. Is I had like, oh, hold on. Is that what I was trying to do? Because I, what happened was I pulled that picture up and it, I couldn't blow it up any, anymore. And I, I wanted it to look cool for you guys. So this picture right here, can I see? That's the thing. I, like, it's not giving me the zoom in. This is not the full res version. And they did release the full res version. So let me see if I can find it. Just because I happened to find some really cool things in this picture. And I really want to show them to you guys. Um, obviously, I'm not on Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons right now. So if I accidentally broadcast any copyrighted material or whatever while I'm doing my searches, you know, I apologize. Um, it's not intentional, obviously. And this isn't monetized anyway, so who's going to like tell me I'm ripping them off? Uh, James Webb, new images. Let me just try space.com, space.com. Because the one like website had... No? Man, I cannot find it anymore. I'm just going to do my best with what we have, guys. Um... You know what I might do, and I don't like to do this because I don't know whose pictures I'm going to wind up getting, but I'm just going to do the old Google image search. Here we go, 2040 by 10. That's my full res. Now we're talking because now I can zoom in. Okay. That said, this is another one of the really cool pictures from the James Webb. Here we can see all the stars have all those spike patterns. Like I said, that's just going to look at, man, this must be a bright guy just out of frame. That's going to be the signature move of the James Webb uh, for all time. Uh, that's how we're going to always be able to, to tell, yeah, this is a James Webb picture. Um, this is a part of the Carina, ne Carina Nebula, also something called the Eta Carina Nebula. Um, I'm going to go back to our Wikimedia Commons real fast. Carina Nebula. This one I've talked about on the channel before because it is super cool. Um, but this picture really shows it. Uh, this is actually a really big, cool, impressive um, nebula that you have to get somewhere southerly to see. It's very far south in the sky. It's mostly a southern atmosphere object. If you get close to the equator, you can catch it low on the horizon. I observed it from the Keys. It is actually four times the apparent angular size of the Orion Nebula. So if you've seen the Orion Nebula through a telescope, man, you ain't seen nothing. This thing is mind-blowing. And as you can see in this picture, it's pink, right? Hydrogen gas in the visible spectrum glows pink. Um, but as we're going to see, this image is, that we're going to look at it is not pink, but we'll talk about why that is. But do you see this little, and I'll zoom in a little bit. Here we go. So this is the main thing, and then over here, there's this little sort of arc shape. And then there's this region of the arc right here, right? Just this piece. And you see that little blue star right there? 
That is the bright guy that we're seeing in this picture off of screen. See how there's a little nub right here? That is this little nub you see right here, right? This region, just that, is what we're looking at in this picture. It's that small of a piece, and look at the detail here. So what we're seeing, again, this is taken in the infrared, and now this object is actually close to us, which means that it does actually glow in the visible, but they've taken the infrared and they've assigned colors going from red to blue based on where it is in the infrared. So this is actually false color. This is not what it would really look like. But the colors in this image can tell us the wavelengths that we're dealing with. So all this blue that we're seeing, this is getting close to the visible part of the spectrum. Um, this stuff that's lit up here in these reddish oranges, that's further into the infrared. And what's interesting is, um, and gosh, I remember... Looking at this with my roommate, we really zoomed in like this, right? And I've got my reasons for getting way up in there. But do you see... Oh, so first of all, do you see these weird little, like... You can see the hexagon patterns in these stars. This is kind of interesting. But you see how there's like this knob here? So this entire picture is actually full of interstellar gas. It looks like there's only gas here and it's empty out here. But what you're actually seeing is it's much much lower density of gas here. And it's more dense over here. And when I talk about the density of a nebula, nebulae are actually very tenuous objects. They're not very thick or solid like we would think of a cloud of like fog here on the Earth. If you had a nebula made of oxygen and you went into it, you would suffocate. This is basically hard vacuum with a tiny amount of stuff in it. But even with it being so low density, it is slightly more dense here right, than it is out here, and that is enough for us to see it. Uh, but what's happening right here is, what's well, actually happening in the whole image, I can uh, zoom out a little bit and talk about the whole image, and then we'll zoom back in. Newly formed stars that are sort of up off the, the view have pushed out with their radiation pressure and opened up the gas, right, and that's what's allowing us to, to sort of see in here. Otherwise, this would be like a big cloud. Um, where that is put, so imagine that in this sort of direction in the picture, radiation is blowing away that gas and blowing it away. So this knob is basically standing against that stream. So what's happening in that knob is the gas is more dense here than it was nearby. So the less dense gas is blowing away more than it is blowing away there. And what that tells us is that material is beginning to clump together. So when material clumps together in a gas cloud like this, that's how we get stars, right? Except this is kind of a big knob. So what's probably going to happen is it's going to break up into pieces and form multiple stars, right? But stars are probably being formed in there and we just can't see them because the gas is blocking them. But as I was looking at this image and talking to my roommate and talking about this high-density region, I noticed more stuff happening in this picture. So we were kind of looking around, and I saw this. And let me tell you guys, when you know what you're looking for, that's exciting. That's real exciting. And then I saw this, right? What is this? What is happening here? Well, these are what are called Herbig Haro objects. And there's actually several of them. There's over here. Um, as I was looking around, I found more of them. Here's a nice big one that you see right here. Right? Herbig Haro objects. Uh, I think there's more of them in here if you just spend some time looking for them. So what is it? Well, I'm going to bring up an, a, another example of a Herbig Haro that I think makes it really easy to tell what's happening. And then we'll go back and look at that image again, and you'll, you'll recognize what I'm describing. These are Herbig Haro objects. Where's my favorite? This is my favorite picture of a Herbig Haro because, man, this thing is just cool looking. Um, okay, so part of it is blocked by this cloud of gas, but in the openings of the gas, you can clearly see it. Right, this big linear sort of thing. So what's happened is right about in... Actually, I think this is it right here. This bright spot here, I think might be it. 
that is a baby star. That star has just formed, clicked on, and started doing fusion. So what's happening is all this material is collecting and collecting, and as it collapses, the star starts to spin faster and faster, like a figure skater pulling in their arms. And a disk of dust will form around that star of more material that's being pulled in, and that disk will roughly correspond to the equator of that star's rotation. Material falling into that star from that disk is going to be added to the star, but some of it is... Hold up. Okay. Um... You guys, uh, you guys lost me for a second there. Uh, my my uh, streaming software disconnected, and the image looks terrible from what I can see here in YouTube. I apologize, guys. Live show, man. Um, I'll I'll get back to the image and I'll show those things I was talking about. But um, I don't know how much of my audio you heard. I'm just gonna back up and talk about it again. So basically, um. Oh, the stream quality is so terrible. I'm going to have to do some, like, some, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, post-mortem on this and figure out what the heck happened to my stream. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the James Webb image, and then I'll get back to here. So what I was saying is, in this image, if I zoom in, I find, and uh, somebody said, can I make my cursor bigger? Unfortunately, I don't really know how to do that to make it more obvious. But this bright thing that I'm seeing, this bright yellowy guy that I'm trying to draw a circle around, or this sort of yellowy stuff that's almost looks like boomerangs coming out. And what I was saying is what these are, is they're Herbig Haro objects, which is what this is. And basically, um, this is a star that as it's forming, spins faster and faster and faster as material gets sucked in like a figure skater pulling in their arms. It accelerates the spin and that disc of accreting material falling in. Some of it gets heated up to a plasma state, gets ionized and gets drawn up into the magnetic field lines of the newly forming star and gets accelerated off the poles north and south. And as it does robs this, spinning system of some of its energy slowing the rotation enough that the star doesn't immediately throw itself apart. Uh, so what's actually interesting is I've, I've seen objections to the nebular hypothesis, the idea that stars form out of clouds of gas and say like, oh, a star can't form because it'll eventually speed up to the point where it flings itself apart. This is actually part of the solution to that. Herbig Haro objects are why stars don't just spin themselves to pieces while they're forming. Because those jets of ions getting flung above and below the star at relativistic speeds, meaning like accelerating at near the speed of light steals angular momentum from the star and keeps it from spinning itself apart. But also what happens is that stuff hits the interstellar medium. And this is interesting because it looks like this piece of, of the sky is empty, right? Like there's obviously a cloud here and here, but there's nothing here, but you can see all this that's glowing is not actually the material flying away from the star. That's invisible. What you're seeing is it strikes and ionizes all the gas that was already there, like a laser shining through fog. And so it reveals that this actually is all full of interstellar medium, even if it looks empty. And that's what that is. So when you're seeing these Herbig Haro objects in this picture, and I really do hope that you will take the time uh, to zoom way in and look for the telltale signs you are seeing the uh, the birth of new stars. Here's another one. This one's kind of obscure, but this is... So they almost look like they have boomerangs at the end. So when you find that boomerang shape, there's probably... A, it stretches down a bit, but the end is the brightest, easiest part to, to, to spot. Um, and just like how... And this is where I get poetic about it, but, you know, when we're born, we announce our birth, right? We start screaming and crying, Stars, do, when this is the stars version of crying at birth, is it throws out these these jets. So you're seeing stars, you know, when introducing their birth to the universe in the form of these, there's probably a star right about here, it's throwing one up and throwing one down um, that forms those, those, those jets. And that's one of my favorite things about this particular image which I will now um, zoom out of again. 
um, that, but also, yeah, see here you can see it, over here you can see it, there's right there, the image is just full of them. But also, I just think it's just beautiful, man, it's just an absolutely beautiful picture. Uh, I'm going to check the chat real fast and see what you guys are talking about. Uh, no one's missed a single syllable. Oh, okay. I My computer literally told me, like, OBS lost its connection for a bit there. So I guess um, you probably will lose syllables. Or no, never mind, you wouldn't because you, if you heard me, that was after that happened. Well, anyway, I repeated myself. Hopefully that wasn't too uh, painful for you guys to have to sit through that explanation twice. But... I just wanted to make sure that, you know, nobody missed it. Um, I'm looking here. It looks like we had up to nine people watching live. That's cool, man. And people have been like, the line's been going up and down. So people have been jumping in, some hopping off. So that's awesome, dude. Um, again, as I always say, if you're here, man, say hi. I love to know who's watching. Uh, even if you don't have a question about anything or a comment, just be like, hey, Dave, what's up? I'm watching. And then I know you're watching. And I know a lot of people are watching like by like throwing it up on their TV or whatever and they can't comment and I'll hear about it tomorrow at work and stuff and that's cool too. All right. There's a couple more images from the James Webb and we have a half an hour left in the show, which is cool. Um, and I think a half an hour might be long enough for me to talk about these next couple of images uh, because a couple of them I don't have a lot to say about them like I did about a couple of those that I did. Um, ooh, yeah, we're going to come back to that guy. This one. Now, these are actually two different instruments on the James Webb. These were both James Webb pictures. This one was taken by Neary, the Near Infrared, or sorry, Near Cam, Near Infrared Camera. And this was taken by Miri, Mid Infrared Instrument. And they both are images of the same object, and that is an object called the Southern Ring Nebula. And I wonder if I can find it in Stellarium. Let's see. Go back to Stellarium. Remember Stellarium? <laughs> we haven't spent a lot of time in Stellarium tonight. Uh, Southern Ring Nebula. There it is. Um, okay, that's interesting. It's um, it's near Vela. Vela is a southern, not super southern. You can see it. I've seen it from um, like the Keys, but more so southern hemisphere. Uh, constellation, and there it is, right there, Caldwell. It's also on the Caldwell list. That's interesting. Caldwell list is a list of objects. Um, Sir Patrick Moore compiled this list, but he didn't want to use M because M already stood for Messier, right? So M for Moore would be confusing, so he used like his, his mother's maiden name and called it the Caldwell list. It's another set of objects you can look for uh, that are particularly impressive and visible through amateur scopes. So... Maybe next time I'm down in the Keys, I might try to make a point of observing this thing uh, with, with visible light. Um, what we're seeing, though, in the James Webb pictures, uh, again, these are infrared images in which colors have been assigned. So this is not what this object looks like in visible light um, because this is a nearby object, so not redshifted enough for that reassignment to actually make sense in terms of it looking like how it would look. I'm actually curious to see what it looks like in visible light. So I guess like this. Maybe that. Mm, see how it's all green and red? That that smacks of false false color to me. Because the Hubble has its own system of like assigning green to oxygen and red to hydrogen, whatever. Where a lot of Hubble images are sort of like these green and red, red looking guys. But there's like significance to those colors. But anyway, uh, who knows? But that's what that image is. Where did it go? Um, I've often said on this channel, and I will say it again, that Planetary Nebula is a dumb name. These have nothing to do with planets. It's the dumbest name in the history of dumb names. The first guy to ever see one said, hmm, kind of looks like a planet, and it's stuck. That's literally all it is. But what we are looking at, and I do talk about this a lot on the channel, but you never know, we might have new viewers. Um, when an average size star, something around the size of the sun, um, ends its life, uh, or reaches the end of its, sorry, ends its life, has implications, reaches the end of its life, um, and it runs out of fuel in the core, the core undergoes core collapse, the energy of the collapse allows it to take that helium that it's made and turn it into carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and it does this in a sort of cyclical manner, collapse, expand, collapse, expand, and as it does, the radiation of those events 
puffs the outer layers of the star out into a red giant and then continues doing so until they all just sort of drift away in an expanding spherical cloud of hot glowing ionized gas with a chunk of carbon in the middle carbon oxygen nitrogen all kind of solidified in the middle not doing fusion but just glowing from heat just being so hot that it glows and that's what you're seeing here and this star in the middle is that white dwarf we call that a white dwarf What's interesting, though, is this white dwarf is actually part of a binary pair. So this thing died, but it's not alone. So in the middle of this big sphere of dead star, it has a friend. There's a second star. And obviously the white dwarf is going to be smaller and less gravitationally significant than any actual active star. So, and oh, and actually that might be the one that we're seeing here, not the white dwarf. But the white dwarf is actually orbiting around that other one there in the middle of this expanding ionized cloud of what used to be that star. Um, and then that's mainly all I have to say about this image, um, except that these two, oh, here they are zoomed in. So there's the uh, mid infrared, mid infrared. That's mind you, that's further into the infrared than the near infrared. Um, and then this is the near infrared. So this is just below the visible spectrum. Uh, let's talk about this. This is probably the last uh, um, James Webb image I'm going to discuss tonight. I saved it for last because it is really, really cool. This is a, a group of galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet. And it does not look like this in the visible spectrum. I'll show you what it looks like in the visible spectrum. Stefan's Quintet. Okay. Oh, and you know what I'll do real fast? I'll go back to Stellarium, and I will show you where this one, because this one is absolutely um, not painful at all. Cool, cool. Uh, this one is absolutely um, something that an amateur can see. Uh, from what I understand, it's kind of faint, kind of difficult. This would definitely be a challenge object. Um, but it is very um, available in the Northern Hemisphere because it is located um, near Pegasus, right near the constellation Pegasus, which is actually not that far from the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, again, apparently though, they're fairly faint. They're not easy to spot. Right here they are, it's a grouping of galaxies. Uh, if we go back to my Wikimedia here, um, this is what Stefan's Quintet looks like invisible light right this is a hubble image of stefan's stefan's quintet and remember that the hubble does visible light imagery so here is a pair of interacting galaxies this is actually one galaxy here's another every bright glowy bit is the core of a galaxy here's another galaxy over here and here's one with a nice big wide bar feature and the arms are coming off but you can see it's heavily distorted there's this big trail coming off over here Right, and there's also a bunch of material that's gotten spilled sort of between these guys. This these galaxies are actively messing with each other. This galaxy is like one of these things. It's not like the others. Right, this one doesn't look a thing like the other galaxies. Um, the reason why this is actually closer to us than the others, and it's actually it's, it's either closer or further. I think it's closer, and it's sort of like photobombing this image. This is actually. Um, not a part of, not a true member of this group. It's like you have all these galaxies and you have this one out here. But from our perspective, it lines up to form a quintet. But actually, it's it's Stefan's, uh, with have like a quartet here. And then this guy is just sort of hanging out. Um, the James Webb, though, is using infrared light. And I keep saying that over and over again. So I really want to em emphasize that. But one of the reasons, because I didn't want to talk about what are some of the reasons why the James Webb is, is why go through all this trouble to get not visible light? Well, we talked about the redshift, so it lets us see further than we possibly could. We talked about cool objects, like cool objects like that. Yeah, man, they're cool, but also not very hot, like planets. We can actually analyze the atmospheres of exoplanets in a wavelength of light that they are actually going to tell us something. But also, um, interstellar dust, like these thick clouds of material, which you see these sort of like smears and stuff in this picture, um, obscures 
the things behind it, right? So, like, if we look at, um, if I show you Stellarium again, Stellarium has a bit of a simulation of this. If we look at the Milky Way, right, we see over here these dark sort of regions of the Milky Way, these sort of gaps in the Milky Way. And actually, there's just as many stars here as there are either side. But we just can't see them because there's too much stuff in the way. Well, it turns out that in the infrared, that stuff isn't a problem. It doesn't block the light like it does in the visible. So that's another advantage to using infrared. And so there's more reason why so much was devoted to making an infrared telescope. So with no further ado, this is one of the... And where's the other one? Because there's actually another one that I really like. This is the other one. These are two different versions of Stefan's Quintet taken with the James Webb. This one was taken with the Miri instrument, which is the mid-infrared instrument, which means this is getting pretty deep into that infrared part of the spectrum. So all the visible light stuff, gone, right? This is deep infrared stuff. You see, we don't see any of that intervening dust, right? But what we do see are things that are just kicking off a ton of infrared light. And what it's showing us is places where stars are being born, right? The blue galaxy is really lit up a star formation, and we can tell that in the other picture as well. Uh, this galaxy, look at these interesting structures that we weren't able to see in the visible spectrum, but the infrared reveals how much this galaxy actually is getting messed up by the interaction, right? These two galaxies, all we can see is their cores and some of this stuff, and then this big streamer out here. And we can get some notion of like the composition of the of all this look at this green this eerie green looking stuff in here right that green is assigned to a specific wavelength i wonder what it relates to i'll have to look into that um and then this image is more like for the wow factor this is the near infrared and mid infrared stacked right in this one because the mid infrared is further down the spectrum than the near instead of giving it the full color treatment like they did here um, they assigned it the reddest colors because it's further down. So the bluer bits in this image were taken by the near infrared cam, and then the fiery red. Look at this man! It looks like it's on fire. It looks cool. That is the stuff that we see in the Miri image, right? And here you start to really get an idea that these colors are just a tag. They can. It's the image is actually grayscale, and they assign the color later. So the same wavelength of light that they assigned all these shades of blue and green became reds and oranges. They colorized it red and orange in this picture because in this context, it's further into the infrared, right? Uh, I love Stefan's Quintet. I think it's really cool. This image of it is actually the lock screen on my phone. Uh, so when I hit the button and my phone comes up, I see Stefan's Quintet, then I unlock it. Um, and then my other screen, my actual background, is the Carina Nebula. So my lock screen and my background image on my phone are two of the objects that the James Webb happened to image, um, <clears throat> which was pure coincidence, but I, I was kind of, uh, found that kind of funny when they released all the images and I was like, oh man, it's my phone lock screen. And then that's after I unlock my phone. <laughs> right. Um, but that, um, that was a tour of the images of the James Webb. We've got about, um, math. 17 we got about 17 minutes left in the stream i'm going to check the comments uh okay same comments hopefully the stream quality is is um is there for you guys hopefully we're not um you know having any problems although in my preview it, it looks like it's pretty good um i'm going to use the rest of the show to do the housekeeping stuff i do this at the beginning and the end of every show i'm going to kind of run through it a little bit um, but I just want to remind everybody that I am on the board of directors of the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society, also known as NEFIS. Uh, NEFIS is the astronomy club here in Jacksonville. And if you are interested in astronomy, definitely check us out. If you are an amateur astronomer yourself or you have kids and you want to get into it, um, a lot of families uh, join our club because... They're very new to the hobby. They bought their kid a telescope, and then people join because they're actually astronomers. And you actually don't even need equipment to join the club. Some people actually join our club because they just like coming to all our stuff, and they just want to support us, and that's cool too. Um, but if you want to be a member, you can go to the website, 
uh, nefas.org. Uh, you can join Nefas. If you have any questions about the club, you can always uh, email info at nefas.org, or you can email me directly, membership at nefas.org. Um, if you have, especially if you have questions about membership, also, um, I often will answer questions about like what telescope should I buy or whatever. Although now that I'm saying that publicly over YouTube, I might get inundated and have to say, never mind, figure it out. Uh, but for now, I do like um, helping people buy their first telescope as well. But this is our membership application. You can fill it out right on the website, new or renew. So if you are an existing club member looking to renew, yes, you hit join Nephis, but you can renew your membership here. Fill all that stuff out. Right. I like how there's a, um, where is it? Uh, how did you find out about us, man? We need to add a thousand shimmering lights as one of the ways that you might've found out about us. Oh no, this, sorry. This is what social media do you use, but on the physical paper form, it's just like, how did you find out about Nevis? And I think we should have a check mark for that. Uh, these are the membership rates, students and seniors. These are annual rates. Mind you, this is per year. Students and seniors, 20 bucks, man. 20 bucks for the year, can't beat it. Seniors, 55 plus. That's most of our club. I'm going to catch some hate for saying that, <laughs> but it's true. Um, individual memberships, those are $40. Uh, and then family is 50 uh, Nephis does not get into the um, thing about what is a family. We consider a family to be any two grown adults and however many children they happen to be in charge of. Take a sip of my water real fast. Any two adults and however many children they happen to be in charge of, that's a family, right? And then benefactor and corporate are just for people who want to donate more to support the club. You don't get anything different for being a benefactor. I mean, you, your name is in the newsletter, which is nice. Um, but really, if you're if you're new to the club or anything, just I recommend individual um, benefactor, if you just really believe in what we do and you really want to support us, that's all that is just a way to do that. And then corporate membership is for like, if you own a business and you want to sponsor the club and have us advertise in our newsletter, you can do that. Uh, and then you'll get an email from me saying, welcome to the club, right? Uh, we are also a member of the astronomical league. Uh, we also, and I forgot to mention this at the top of the hours, uh, the top of the two hours, um, but we also have a telescope loaner program where people can borrow six inch aperture Dobsonian telescopes. If you're a member of Nephis, you can literally check it out like a library book for a month and give it back. So if you, again, this is a big selling point for like families who want to get into it, not sure what to get their kid, you know, not sure any of this stuff, or just really need all of it. You can literally use our telescopes, right? And, and that's a, that's a value there. You can check it out and bring it back and say, oh man, we loved it, dude. Um, we do ask that you don't just check it out back to back, right? If you check it out and bring it back, we're going to try and lend it out to other people. Um, try to take a month off, but I mean, you know, if no one's asking for it, you know, uh, but that's a thing. And of course, again, our calendar of events for those of you who weren't here at the beginning of the show, again, just going to kind of go through these sort of quickly because I want to spend all night on it, but we do have two dark sky observing sessions coming up. Those are the inwardly focused. Those are the things we do for us. They're not outreach. They are us going out in the middle of the woods and observing. That said, they are open to everybody and they are friendly. You're not going to like come out and have us be like, no, this is our spot. Like, it's not like that. Just bear in mind that it's not like, um, it's not like a, a outreach event where we're all set up and people are lining up to look through the telescope and we're giving presentations most of the people out there are using their own equipment, making their own observations, and they may be, you know, very into what they're doing and may occasionally say like, hey, come take a look through the eyepiece, but just expect that it's that kind of atmosphere. It's more so this is the this is their inwardly focused thing. Also, it's very remote. We don't have any bathroom facilities. There is wildlife out there, right? So just keep all that in mind. Um, also, I'm not expecting the weather to be great on Saturday. But um, weather permitting, we'll have people to meet you at uh, Firehouse Subs if it's your first time heading out. And then getting into next month, um, we're going to have our picnic uh, first Saturday. Um, that's a members only thing, members and guests. But after that, from 7 o'clock to honestly when we all get tired and go home, uh, we're going to have our Hannah Park Stargaze, which is our, 
our that is our public thing. That is our outwardly focused event for people to come and look through telescopes, learn about the universe, and just have a great time. I give a laser pointer tour of the sky. It's sort of a short version of what you get at the beginning of my broadcasts where I point out the constellations and talk a little bit about what's up there, maybe tell some myths, that kind of thing. It's a great time. I honestly highly recommend it. And then, of course, uh, next uh, broadcast is going to be on the 18th of August. So August 18th, um, unless extenuating circumstances, that's going to be the next Thousand Shimmering Lights broadcast. And that wraps it up with about 10 minutes left on the clock. I'm going to check out the chat real fast. Uh, Yeah, we should ask... Uh, we should put, yes, I heard from a thousand shimmering lights, um, and us old people. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it, man. Um, I did want to mention something that doesn't have anything to do with astronomy, but it's just something that happened to me this week and I've got a platform. So why not? Um, we talked a little bit earlier about James Webb and his legacy, but also, uh, I was on Facebook and I saw a post and it was very bigoted. It was, it honestly surprised me how bigoted it was. Didn't have anything to do with astronomy. It was a different group entirely. And it turned out the post was by an admin. So I'd left the group. I was like, nah, um, it was actually what it was is it was like a Lord of the Rings fan group. And I was like, nah, I'm good. Uh, and it just got me to thinking, first of all, it was really surprising to me because it was so blatant. Um, And I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the things I like about astronomy is it puts us in perspective. It puts us where we are because we see how vast the universe is and how small the earth is. And I just wanted to say to everybody listening, whoever you are, whatever your, however you identify, whatever your preference, your religion, anything about you. You are a child of the good earth and you are my brother or sister in humanity and the human race. And I believe the earth is small and I don't think we have room on this earth for bigotry flat out. And when I saw that Facebook post, like I said, I just left that group. I was like, if that's what the admins are like, I'm out of here. And I just wanted to say that. I don't know. I just like, I feel like I got a platform and, and the official stance of A Thousand Shimmering Lights is that the earth is too small for bigotry, right? We all share this planet. In fact, I'm going to bring up the, uh, the pale blue dot image to really drive it home. Pale blue dot, right? This was a picture taken by the Voyager spacecraft, right? Uh, can we get a better picture of it? Uh, honestly, the quality of the stream may not even show it, but you see these little beams of light here. This is the sun's kind of off the image as the Voyager was like leaving. It turned around and took a picture of the earth. And where is the earth in this picture? Well, if I zoom in, right, I'm zoomed in about as much as it will let me zoom in this little blue dot. That's the earth, right? And I never noticed there's a second dot here. Is that the moon? That'd be really cool if it was. That's, that's us, man. That's everybody who's ever lived, right? Every saint, every sinner, you know, the Carl Sagan quote, there's just no room on that, on that dot for hate. I don't think, right? I, for me personally, if that's as much room as we get, I want that whole planet devoted to love, not hate. So again, it has nothing to do with astronomy. It's just something that came up this week and something I wanted to say. Uh, publicly for everyone to hear that I just don't think there's room for it here on the earth and there's not room for it on my channel. Thankfully, no one said anything bad in the chat or anything. It's not, it's not like I'm calling anybody out, but if somebody happens to be watching this and you have room for hate in your heart, unsubscribe because I'm not interested. Right. But for those of us who have love in our heart and who want to learn, this little blue dot is for all of us and for all of us to share together And so is the sky when we look up from that pale blue dot. So I very much encourage you to get out somewhere dark and see the thousand shimmering lights uh, that are above our heads every night and put yourself in that cosmic place where you realize that 
we are all on this earth together in the vastness of this incredible universe and that there is so much beauty out there and so much interesting stuff that we can, that we can see and that we can learn about. And, uh, and yeah, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your month until I see you guys next month and remember to keep looking up and maybe, uh, you know, (laughs) aim down your outdoor lights if you have them so that we can all see it. Uh, and I'm just going to zoom back in again here, right? Get back to that pale blue dot that is our home. And of all the images taken by the James Webb, I kind of want to leave you guys with this picture. Uh, we got five minutes left in the stream, but I don't really know what else we could talk about. I'm just going to keep an eye on the chat and see if anyone's saying anything. But uh, otherwise, I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. I think I've said that already. I've said that multiple times. Uh, but also, thank you, man. Thank you guys so much. I, I say this every stream, but it really honestly means a ton to me that so many people tune in to watch this and watch them later. I've, I've looked at my metrics and I've noticed a lot of my watches are actually later on. People watch them later. Uh, and, and I really appreciate that because it means you guys all want to learn and you want to, uh, experience the, the universe and, and, and all that cool stuff. So thank you again. I'm going to watch the chat for another four minutes and then I'm going to throw the title card up and, Hope you guys have a great night. Okay, well, at the last three minutes, somebody did actually send me something astronomy related. So, um, I'm going to see if I can uh, pull it up. Apparently, there is an image from the James Webb Telescope uh, of Jupiter that actually does show the rings. Let me see if I can can find it here. James Webb, Jupiter's rings. Um... Yeah, here you go. So this picture really shows it. Did you guys know that Jupiter had rings like Saturn? They're just really thin, very faint, hard to see. But it really does. Isn't that cool? Like Saturn's rings, um, they're made of uh, mostly ice, right? Uh, Mostly ice and little bits of rock and that kind of thing. All right, so I guess that's a good place to call it since I'm just kind of staring at the screen screen now. Uh, So again, you guys have a wonderful evening and keep looking up.